Okay, thank you very much uh, for coming and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, which is a discussion on a project that's been going on for about the last two years uh, using satellite pop-up tags to look at the bathymetric behavior of lean and Susquehanna lake trail in Lake Superior. Uh, I can't really see, where's the, uh, the thing here? Oh, I got it. Can't really see the screen from this angle. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, lake trout morphotypes like leans and siskouettes are differentiated on the basis of morphometry uh, and also on other aspects like lipid levels and some other physiological uh, variables. But they're also ecotypes in that leans are considered to be deep water, or leans are considered to be shallow water forms and siskouettes are considered to be deep water forms. So we've been using these uh, satellite pop-up tags from Desert Star in order to interrogate the, the very specific uh, bathymetric behavior of lean and cisco at uh, lake trout in uh, Lake Superior. So if you're looking at the, this picture, uh, this is a, a picture of the, of the tag from Desert Star and it has a data logger in the middle that's powered by a battery when it's underwater and it's tethered to the fish, which I'll show you in, in a minute. Between the tether and the data logger, there is a, a chamber that has gunpowder in it, and at a predetermined time that you program into the tag, there's a charge that goes to that. It blows off the data logger portion from the tether, and because there's a float on the other end of it, it then goes to the surface. And then at the surface, the data is transmitted to the Argo satellite system, and actually you get a location. You can theoretically get the, all of the data, but we found that it's very, very difficult to get that because you'll see that this is a really data rich, um, uh, this is, a, a, this is a collecting a very large amount of data, so it's really hard to transmit all of that to the satellite system. So we found that you could uh, get these tags after they pop up using direction finding equipment, and this is Sean Sitar holding a, a tag that we got in Lake Superior. And now we're about 85% efficient in getting the, uh, the tags back that pop up. And really, the only limitation here is the weather and the conditions in the, uh, in the lake. So this is a picture of the uh, harness. It's the one that LaCroix used on Atlantic salmon. We used it exactly like he did. It works really great. It's a single monofilament loop that goes through the fish in two different places under the dorsal fin. And this is a picture of the, uh, of the tag on an actively swimming fish to the left bottom and one that's not swimming so actively. And uh, we assume, and I, have, I actually have video of this if people want to see this after the meeting. I have, I have video of the harnessing procedure and video of these fish using GoPro uh, being released. Um, we're assuming that it doesn't affect behavior, but we don't know for sure. So this, we first started deployments of these tags in 2014 um, in the spring. And really this was just to get to, to to know the tags, uh, how to program the tags, how to put them on the fish, and how to get the tags back. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about this, but we really found out a lot more about what not to do with the tags and what to do with them during this time. So at the top there, um, in the fall of 2014, we began in earnest to tag wild fish off of Marquette, Lee and Siskiwetz. And these are, you can see, for fairly large deployments of eight months from November to June. And then in the spring of 2015, we tagged 60 fish, 30 from uh, fish that are cultured at the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility. It's part of a, a common garden variety experiment that I've going since uh, 2006. And then down at the bottom, you see that we tagged another 30 fish from around Isle Royale. And those deployments were either four or three and a half months, depending upon uh, the source of the fish. So I'm really going to concentrate on the wild fish in my talk, and Andy Gisanovich, who's talking after me, is going to really describe the NADF fish, which are interesting in themselves. So getting right to the data, these are <coughs> these are depth um, uh, these are the depth profiles for three um, leans, and they were uh, tagged for eight months, uh, eight month period from November to June. And these are representative of, I think, the five or six uh, that we uh, collected. So I just did representative examples. And I think you can see that for the most part, these leans stay uh, shallower than about 40 meters. 
Uh, there's a, some excursions that go down. I'll talk about them in, in a minute. But for the most part, they're shallow as, as we uh, might have expected them. And if you were able to see the, the individual dots on that, on that figure, they are 10 minute intervals apart. They're, this is a 10 minute frequency of collection. So this is the depth pro this is the temperature profile with the uh, depth for one of these uh, for one of these um, uh, trout, and it's not surprising since these fish are staying shallow that the that the depth profile uh, really mirrors what the temperature is for the, for the surface. So of course uh, it's warm warmer in the fall and then it goes down to about zero degrees you can see, and then it goes back up into the spring. So nothing really special about that. This is the the light that's being recorded in the uh, tag uh, from the same fish. And at this point you can see something that's a little more complicated. You see an upper uh, part. I just can't do this, but you see an upper part and a lower part. Then you see some uh, dots in between. So what you're really looking at is that fish is pretty close to the surface. So the tag is picking up the photo period. So you can pick up the exact day-night cycle. Um, the top part is the daytime. The bottom part is the, the nighttime. And then in between is the sunrise sunset. So the one part that you, you don't see this light or you see a little bit of light is in February and then January. Uh, you see some light, but not, you don't see that photo period. And so we presume at that point that the fish is under the ice. So this is during the period when there was ice cover on, on Lake Superior. And most of the leans have this, uh, this, this type of uh, uh, light uh, display. So when you look at these uh, traces, you get, uh, you get the impression that things are uh, pretty random, that the fish is going up, the fish is going down, and that there's no directionality or rhyme or reason to this. But when you really look at this in, in much higher resolution, you find that that's not the case. So that little box up there, let's look at what occurs in April. And now you can see the actual daylight cycle. See the nighttime and the low light in the upper, uh, the, the daytime. And you can see initially the, the depth, which is in black. It doesn't really change with the photo period, but then all of a sudden you start to see this change where it goes up at night and it goes down during the daytime. So it's avoiding the uh, upper levels uh, during the daytime and going up at nighttime. And I bet this is over a very small distance, it's about three meters, so it's really not that far, but still, there's, this is not random movement, it's directional according to the uh, photo period. So what happens uh, in a period where, the, where the, the light is low, like in this period in January, February? So if you increase the resolution of the, uh, the light scale, you can really still see the, the day-night cycle and that's shown on the bottom there. Um, you can still see the daytime and the nighttime, and now what you see is that there's an opposite movement of the fish in relationship to light. Instead of going down during the day, it's going up, and then it goes down at night. So it does this for a little while, then it stops, and then it does it again for a little while. So during those traces, you'll see some relationship with light, and then sometimes you won't see relationship with light. But there is, there is some periodicity to this. Okay, so these are representative traces for leans that were tagged for three and a half months. And those earlier ones were during the winter, late fall, winter, and then early spring. And these ones are spring to summer to early fall. So we really have traces for these fish all year round. It's just in, in two uh, different batches. And uh, these again are representative, and I just point out that it's, it's difficult to see this, but the fish in, in this time of year are generally much more active. As they go up and down, there's a lot more activity of them, but that's probably because of the temperature of the water. And you can still see that these fish remain fairly shallow, below about 40 or 50 meters. There's probably more excursions downward. And those excursions are kind of interesting. Um, and I should point out that each one of these data points is every four minutes. So before it was 10 minutes, this data collection was every four minutes, so higher. And if we take a look at this one, for example, you see, if you blow it up, that they go down and they stay for a little bit and then go back up. And, this, and the time that they're down there is about an hour. So they're not just going down and going back up. They're staying for a little bit. And they're not really moving too much. And then they go back up. 
In opposition, you will find ones like these two, where they actually go down. It's the same resolution as the previous one. They go down in four minutes or four to eight minutes, and then they go right back up as if they're following something. And note that that's about 50 meters that they're going down. So what about their activity in relationship to light? So I, I previously said that they seem to be more active during the summer, and probably related to temperature and searching for food. Um, and it doesn't seem directional, going up or down. So what, we're, what we have now quantified is the incremental change between every four minute uh, uh, sampling time, with the hypothesis that if they're more active, then this number is gonna get larger, either negatively or positively, depending on whether they're going up or down. So you can use this to quantify the data, to do statistics, but I'm just showing you this in relationship to the photo period or the light cycle, which is up above it, being measured in the tag. And you can see for the most part, these fish are most active during the daytime. And that's pretty consistent across the leans. There's some activity at night, but mostly it's during the day. So in summary for the, for the wild leans, um, they stay at fairly shallow depths uh, throughout the year. And they inhabit very, uh, they can inhabit pretty cold temperatures during the winter, probably under the ice to zero degrees. But I've analyzed all the traces that we have and I've never seen any of these lean lake trout go above 15.8 degrees. I don't know if that's their thermal, op the, the, the highest level that they can withstand or whether that's the level of the temperature in the lake at the, at where they're found. They can exhibit non-random vertical movements, albeit over pretty small distances. Uh, and, they, and they also have uh, activity that's related to photo period, and in the summertime, it, it's, uh, it's increased activity. So what about, what about the Cisco West? They're, they're quite a bit different than leans. These are two representative traces for eight-month deployments. And uh, then these are every 10 minutes. These is the frequency of every 10 minutes. And the first thing you notice right away is that they can go very deep, 350. To, uh, to 300 uh, meters, and actually in some traces we've seen down to 400 meters, so well over 1,000 feet. They don't spend a lot of time there, but when, <coughs> when they're not at that depth, they still can be very deep. And it looks like the traces is that they're following the bottom. Uh, we don't know that for a fact, but it looks like they're following the bottom in that, in that case. But the other thing that you notice right away is that they undergo these vertical migrations over pretty extensive um, depth ranges. These vertical migrations are not consistent between individuals. In some cases, they're, they're be undergoing vertical migrations where other ones will not when you look on that. So it's a little bit of individualistic uh, activity. When you look at the temperature profile related to depth, it's much more complicated because these fish are at great depths where the temperature is low all year round. But then it gets a lot more complicated in the winter when they start going towards the surface because the surface temperature is actually colder than it is where they are in the deep. So therefore, it goes down to about zero degrees. But generally, these fish are found at very cold temperatures, which you'd expect at uh, deep, under deep conditions. The conditions with light is very, very different than uh, leans. You don't see very much light on, the, on this axis down here. And you could hypothesize, well, it's very deep, so they shouldn't really, the tag shouldn't be seeing very much light. And you're right. Uh, when they're below 50 meters, probably you won't see very much light in these tags, but there's a, a good number of uh, times when these fish are above 50 meters and the leans could easily perceive that light. So what, what's occurring during that time? Let's take a look at this, this area and expand it. And what you see is that in those particular cases, whenever the fish comes up, it's coming up in the nighttime. So the way to read that is that the dark bands are the night and the light bands are the daytime. And if you look at that, every one of those ones are coming up exactly in the middle of the night. And that's, that's pretty consistent for most of the vertical migrations of these fish, for the very uh, extensive vertical migrations. Um, so, <clears throat> when, as I said, when you looked at those two traces before, it almost looks like all of these ciscoettes do something different and they're all individualistic, but actually there is some consistency between them, and we've seen now a large number of traces from Cisco West, for, for example, at three and a half months uh, deployments. And so what I've, I'm gonna show you every one of the traces for those fish, and I grouped them according to ones that are similar, that do similar things. So here's two traces, um, just to give you a background, at the very beginning of the uh, graph here, these fish were collected at about 100 and 150 meters off of Hawk Island of Isle Royale. 
and then they were tagged and released. So those two fish go back down to those areas and stay there for about the same amount of time. And then they start to go, undergo these extensive vertical migrations. Next two fish, they stay for a little bit longer at that, at that point, and then they also undergo extensive vertical migrations and then start following, them. it looks like following the bottom. And then the last two are quite different. They stay for a while at that depth. This one's doing a little bit different thing here, but it's sort of concentrating its time at that depth. And then it goes up to the surface and it stays at the surface. And they stay at the surface, if you look at the bottom there, for over a month. And then after that month time, then they start to go down and they start to do vertical migrations uh, after that. So what's happening here when these fish are staying at the surface? So it's pretty interesting. If you expand that, you're measuring the tag light at the top here, and now the depth shown here. And you see that during the daytime, they go down a little bit, and that's probably only about four meters. And then uh, during the night, they go up, and they're directly on the surface at that time. So anytime you see this ribbing effect, I don't know if you can see it up on the top there, you'll see this kind of, of uh, periodicity, where they go up at night and go down during the day. We presume that what they're doing at this point is feeding on insects that are at the, at the surface. And it's apparent that these fish, they're in very high light uh, intensity or concentration, so light is really not inhibiting them from being at the, at the surface. So in summary for the uh, Siskiwets, they inhabit a variety of depths during the year, but frequently they're at very great depths, 150 to 400 meters. They exhibit vertical migrations over large depth ranges, and those things can occur at all times of the year. Many of these extensive vertical migrations occur at night, and if you look at all of them, and not, not every single one of them, but many of them occur during the nighttime when they're doing these 100 to 300 meter vertical migrations. They can be at the surface under pretty high intensity light for really long periods of time, as demonstrated by those two fish that were there for a month and a half. And I didn't uh, show you this data, but in terms of temperature, I have not seen traces of these fish um, generally above 11 degrees. So they, they usually maintain 11 degrees or, or lower. And I would suggest that their actual movement to the surface is determined by the temperature more so than the light. So at the very end of the summer, when they're going into the fall, I think it has to do with the surface temperature or the temperature that they're going towards that limits the actual migration towards the surface. And with that, I'd like to thank the uh, members of the Lake Char. It's a Michigan DNR vessel that uh, collects fish with us. And um, also I'd like to thank the funding of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and acknowledge the Michigan DNR, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the National Park for Isle Royale. Thank you.